This is Brian Medor from East Carolina University. You are listening to the Sports Objective, the official, unofficial podcast of the Pirates. Welcome in to the Sports Objective. Very special night, our regional uh, preview, our special, if you will, with us, ladies and gentlemen, Kyle from LaGrange. Barbara, how are you, man? What's going on? It's a bird. It's a plane. No, no, it's Super Dave. Actually, no, it's not Super Dave. You remember him, Super Dave Osborne? Oh, yeah. Anyway, I think he uh, passed away, didn't he? So I, I'm still I, alive. I, 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 maybe his career are, is dead. You are still alive. That's, that's true. <laughs> I hope so. If not, it's weekend at Bernie's. Uh, Bubba Rosenbaum, what's up, dude? Fired up for some postseason baseball. Um, we're here in less than 16 hours to at least scheduled first pitch. We'll see when it actually happens. And last uh, yesterday was National Bubba Day. Corey Glor, I know you're here. That's why you're here tonight. Not about the regionals. We're talking about National Bubba Day. Uh, what do you think, my friend? I mean, I can't believe I missed it. Um, I'm sorry, Bubba, but happy day yes. to you yesterday. I, I feel heartbroken that I did not do anything for you. Um, consider this my gift. I was going to say you can make it. I up appreciate tonight, that. I, I went through baseball. National Bubba Day without you saying anything. It was hard to sleep last night. Yeah, um, <laughs> he was waiting for the shout out. He never got it. I just, it slipped through. But my people did not inform me in a timely mm -hmm. manner. You, you didn't get the memo, right? So we'll let you off the hook. All right. Well, let's talk some baseball. I know that you. Uh, this this is the moment we've been waiting for. I know that today the, all the coach speak, every single game is important, uh, but uh, this is what we've been waiting for, the regional. We have fans coming back. And, of course, this time of year, uh, we have staff meteorologist uh, Kyle Barber, um, and uh, I'm sure he can tell us the weather forecast for the weekend and when we're going to play our first when first pitches. But, Corey, sure, do you think – I'll do it. Wait a minute. I, I just consulted with Ollie Wilson. It's going to rain. Okay. So, Corey, when, uh, do you think, do you have any kind of idea if we're, we're going to play a game tomorrow? Because it's been raining yesterday. It rained today in Greenville. And it's supposed to rain tomorrow. Uh, so, what do you, what, what's your pick uh, for the game? Do you have an idea? Can you get a crystal ball here for us? I think they're going to play a game tomorrow. Uh, I, uh, I mean, they will, they have not made any call yet. They will definitely wake up and, um, take a look at the radar, get to the park before the NCAA is they're the ones that will make this call. Now um, they will decide how the schedule forms from this point forward. I don't think anybody involved with this first game wants to start and then have to stop. And so not day one of this regional. So um, if they have to push the game back into tomorrow evening, even to tomorrow night, they probably will. And then they'll recess the schedule moving forward from there. But to get through tomorrow and hopefully get one of these two games in, then you can get through the rest of the weekend fine because the forecast looks pretty good moving forward. So, um, but yes, it's a regional in Greenville, and that means rain is here. So it is uh, it is the main talking point for many folks, uh, unfortunately, heading into our third straight time doing this. Corey, what about the very fact of the speaking of the weather? Uh, is there a time limit uh, for the NCAA, say, a start time of eight o'clock, nine o'clock? Is there a certain time limit, the latest that we can go? Is there a curfew, in other words? Um, I think that goes in coordination with the city. Um, I remember in 18 when when ECU and South Carolina and the winner's bracket game started. I believe that was a nine o'clock start on a Saturday night. So I, I don't. Uh, there are not going to be many instances where they'll try and play later than that. Um, the schools obviously have to sign off, but there's also a city element to that. And, um, you know, I don't think you're talking about a, you know, 11 o'clock start time for a game. Like I'll say that, like they, they will operate within the bounds of realism here. If, if things get pushed around uh, in a noon, the start time doesn't happen mid afternoon into evening for getting this regional underway. They're not going to um, like go crazy wild with a start time that like if they need to 
play three games on Saturday to get this thing started, they will. Um, but they're not going to go deep into an early morning uh, for opening okay. up the regional. So, so we Southern can't have Miss, midnight yeah. madness. Well, so Southern Miss uh, down at uh, the Conference USA tournament in Ruston, Louisiana. Yeah, uh, which started. floored me. And Conference <laughs> USA signing off on that is pretty insane to me. Because it was but, almost 1 a.m. Yes, it, it was. Uh, I think it was 12:15 Central Time when they yep. started that game. Um, I can't believe those schools in that conference signed off on that. They wanted to get day one. I believe that was day one. Um, it, was. it was day two there. One of the two. Um, they wanted to get that on to try and stay on schedule. But um, you're still talking about 18 to 22 year olds, and that's that's not right. Like that's a that's a bad look for Conference USA. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was got... for the team in the losers bracket. The team in the winners bracket didn't have to go again until the next night, but that losers bracket team had to come on out and play that afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Then that was Western Kentucky that wound up losing that game, and I don't think we heard from them again uh, shortly after that. So, yeah, I, I, I'm. That will not happen here. I'll, I'll make I'll make that stand pretty strong right now. I don't think there any of these four coaches will be in the right. Uh, will be thinking that that's a possibility here. Bubba and I were hoping for Midnight Madness for baseball, so we're not going to get that in Greenville. I mean, can we talk to PJ, a former pitcher for the Pirates? I mean, come on, PJ, we'll have Midnight Madness. A lot of people, instead of going downtown or partying, they can party at Clark LeClaire. Uh I'm sure PJ would take your call, um, but I'm sure PJ will also talk to Cliff, and that will, I think that will miss that right there. I don't want a midnight. I'm just joking. I don't want that time. Um, I would prefer to have a eight o'clock or nine o'clock start would be my preference if we had to do a night game. So not that I, that it matters what I think or want, but um, if we have to have a night game, that would be the more of an ideal time. Seven o'clock would be an ideal time. And we have Hollywood squares here. Um, <laughs> uh as far as the, the team, how, so starting out, one question I had for you. How do you feel about the regional as far as teams? Are you happy with the teams the Pirates uh, were able to get in the regional? Yeah, I think it's a good draw. I, I do, um, for, especially for the 13 seed. Um, now, them being the 13 seed, that means that Charlotte is like fourth highest two seed. Like that's how they work around kind of a snake draft there. Um, and you know, that's, that's Frank, that's probably a little bit lower than where Charlotte should be, but due to how the Columbia regional had to get sorted out with old dominion being the one seed there, they couldn't host in Charlotte because you can't have two conference USA schools in one regional. So that meant South Carolina had to be the two in that regional. And that meant Charlotte had to come here. And so um, I think you get a higher two seed than maybe initially thought, but I think it's um, the fact that you avoid one of the streaking hot ACC schools is notable here that, you know, Maryland comes in on a tear. Um, but I think there's kind of a question as to they haven't played anything outside of the league this year. And so how much involved with what they've done is being up on a big 10 that's okay at the top and not very strong in the middle and bottom and how much of it is what they've done. Um, I, I like the group that's come in here for this regional. I think it sets up nicely for an East Carolina run. Um, they're the best team talent wise of the four. And if they play their baseball, they'll show that and they'll win a regional championship this weekend. We know how weird this weekend can get. Um, and so anything is very much on the table, but for your two seed to be a team that you've seen already this year for the three seed to be a team that is more of a curiosity frankly, for me right now. Um, and then for your four seed to be, you know, a team that was good in their conference this year, that's always kind of been knocking on the door the last few years of getting to this stage, but has never gotten here until now. Um, I think East Carolina wound up with a pretty nice draw out of all this. Corey, as you knew, um, I got the opportunity to catch up with Maryland, Maryland head coach, Maryland head coach Rob Vaughn, and um, you know when I, when I talked to coach, uh, one of the things that really jumped out about this ball club is after a five and nine start, um, they are twenty three and seven. Yeah, they've won eighteen to twenty two. Like it's not like they're 
coming. Like it's, I mean, we talk about NC State and Duke and the streak that they're on here to end the year, and they don't come here. Um, when I think everyone thought at least one of those two was probably heading this way. Well, you don't get that, but you get a Maryland team that has done similar over the last six weeks of the year as to what those two have done. So um, they've done it in a myriad of different ways. They get on base. They got a couple of guys who can steal. They, they will have some sneaky power in that lineup and they got a good one, two punch in the front of the rotation. So um, I think Rob Vaughn is, um, pleasantly surprised at how his team has surged to end this year. Um, and he's called it the greatest run that he's experienced in his time at Maryland. He's in his fourth year as a coach, but he's been there for a while. Um, and so they, they come in with certainly the, the, you know, the most successful run of baseball of any of the four in recent times. Um, they get Charlotte to start things off and, and we'll see how those two navigate through um, some pretty potent lineups that each one has. Um, it will be a pretty fascinating game whenever that takes place here this weekend. Um, but the Pirates can't worry about either of those two yet. Like, they, they got something to take care of first. Corey, one of the questions I had for you regarding, uh, and I guess I should stop, I should be like the team and stop, and coaches stop looking at social media because my blood pressure goes up. Um, I'm a huge, as you know, Cliff Godwin fan, and it just amazes me how we have thousands of people in Pirate Nation that know more than Cliff Godwin. I'm saying that sarcastically, um, that they're questioning why Carson Wisenhunt would start. <laughs> I just think that's outrageous. Uh, they're like, why doesn't Gavin get the ball? So I thought that we would bring that up tonight. Who's, not the, who's questioning it. that, Dave? There's some folks on. Anyway, I was just bringing that up because I want to point out how crazy they are. A coach knows way more than we'll ever know about baseball. And I would never question a decision that he has, especially when he's won a lot more games than I have <laughs> as a coach. So, well, I think what's what's fascinating about how things have set up here to start this regional is that on the surface, none of these teams are actually throwing their main ace in day one. They're throwing their number two. Um, you know, Norfolk kind of has a one A, one B, and the Pirates going to see their lefty James Deloach as opposed to their two-way guy who, who's been sensational this year. He's going to go the second day. Um, Maryland's going to throw their freshman who's been their Friday guy, but they have a veteran in Sean Burke who's going to go day two, and he's been the more consistent of the bunch. And then Charlotte is going to say Bryce McGowan for Saturday, and we remember him for March. He, he was in, locked in a good one against the Pirates, and they're throwing Andrew Lindsay against Maryland. So um, every single team – has a good one too that's allowed him to make this decision and kind of play matchup a little bit more. I initially was a little bit surprised that Wisenhunt was getting the start here um, for a couple reasons. One, because he'll be on a day less rest. He pitched on Saturday in Clearwater, so he's working on one less day. Um, two, he's a freshman and he's going to get, you know, his first regional stage, going to be the first game, first game this year with 5,000 people at it. Um, and three, I, you know, I, I kind of set up for Tyler Smith to get the start because it would be a week and a half since he's gone. Um, but then I, I start diving into Norfolk a little bit more and what they're good at. And what they're good at is making a lot of contact, stealing a lot of bases. They have a ton of speed up and down this order, and they don't hit lefties very well. So when you put all that together and you throw a lefty out there who's also good at controlling the running game and Wizen Hunt, it makes total sense as to why he gets the ball here against the Spartans. It, it is a matchup thing. Like, and then you have Gavin for day two, whomever you're going to see, whatever side of the bracket you're going to be on, you feel great about him, whoever he's going to be pitching against. And then whatever happens after Saturday or game two, whenever it occurs, um, you roll the dice with one of the deepest bullpens and pitching stabs you've had. Um, but Carson against Norfolk, once you dive into what Norfolk is really good at offensively, makes all the sense in the world. Yeah, Bubba was talking about that last night, um, how Norfolk has stolen a ton of bases this year. And uh, Carson has a good pickoff move, playing against a lefty. Just makes it harder to steal bases, period. So uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. And then uh, if you get past Norfolk, now you got Gavin for either Charlotte or Maryland. So, uh, no, nah, I think it's definitely the right move. Yeah, 107 stolen bases on the year for Norfolk. I mean that that's 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 excessive. Like, that, I mean, but that that's been what they've been leaning on this year. And 
they hit about 238 against lefty pitching. And so, like, it, it makes obvious sense why this is the call that the Pirates are making here, even though it's going to be Wizen Hunt in his first outing like this, his first postseason outing of his career. He pitched really well against UCF last weekend in, in a must-win game. And so they, they have the utmost confidence in him to be calm and collected um, on a stage like this. Now he, he's going to be facing a team that if they can get on, they will put a ton of pressure on you, and it's going to be on him to keep his cool about it and make sure that things get nipped in the bud. So because they can – singles turn to doubles pretty quickly against this Norfolk lineup. So um, it's going to be – I think the first three innings of this game um, are going to be really, really interesting to watch. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, in terms of it being the freshman and his first start in a regional, whether it's tomorrow or – whether it was the game two start or the game three start, whatever, it would be his first start in a regional. So yep. yeah, you might as well uh, get it out the way. Put him out there now. Yep, yeah, totally exactly. Agree. Give yep. him the matchup advantage. And also, uh, not to – I don't want to say this wrong, uh, but playing Charlotte or Maryland, there might be a little more, more juice flowing than Norfolk State. The name on the jersey shouldn't matter, but it maybe will make it less intimidating. Not taking anything away from Norfolk State, they certainly can beat us. Uh, Quinnipiac did. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think there might be a little bit of an element to that. I, I think there have been times this year where Carson has had a little bit of trouble maintaining composure throughout starts um, because he's still a freshman, and sometimes things he's been rattled from time to time. Um, Norfolk's very capable of doing that. What they're not really capable of doing is taking mistakes and hitting them out. That is not a home run hitting team. Whereas Charlotte, Maryland, they will take mistakes and really make you hurt for it. Um, Norfolk can do that with their legs. They can't do that with their strength. Do they um, bun a lot? Do they bun a lot, Corey? I mean, I think they'll try. I mean, I, I it's it's a team that, that what they do a lot is make a ton of contact. They do not strike out a ton. And so... And frankly, of the four here, they make maybe the most contact of any of the four offensively. And so, you know, that would lead you to believe they will drop down bunts here or there. And it's a team that mines the most out of the roster that they have. And they've done it successfully this year. So they're going to they'll get sneaky on you like they'll absolutely get sneaky on you and try and force you into miscues. Um, Frankly, these two lineups, the Pirates have far more power than the Spartans do, but when the Pirates are really playing their game, they are doing what, you know, the really small ball, station to station, slash and show sort of bunt, bunt game that Norfolk might be trying as well. Corey, a Corey couple Spurs. things. You brought, you brought up Carson Wisenhunt and his composure being a, a COVID freshman. You know, taking a look at uh, Carson, um, this – most recent appearance against UCF was his fourth appearance since um, that month of not pitching. And um, in all those other appearances, he had never walked more than two. Uh, but against UCF, he did walk more. He allowed that one hit in five innings. And he did a really good job, I thought, of keeping his composure, you know, pitching through some of those tough spots. Yeah, I mean, there were points where he was wild. And UCF is a team that will make you throw strikes. And so there were elements in that he had to work through some real adversity and he was able to do that in his first postseason stage. I think it it sets up nicely for him to make his NCAA tournament debut with what he showed us in Clearwater in a game that the Pirates needed to win. Um, Otherwise we're talking about a very different regional, frankly. So um, the fact that he showed that first time out um, in a postseason appearance, um, it's hard not to be excited about what he might be able to do tomorrow. Awesome. And that, that very thing that we need to uh, definitely keep in mind with uh, that very thing that pirate nation needs to understand is that and most do, I think, um, but Norfolk state can beat us. Any, any of these teams can beat us. One of the questions I want to have, and we love I go, but why in the world did the parent company 24 seven sports pick? <laughs> did you see that? Where they had what was it Maryland beating Charlotte Kyle in the championship game of the Greenville Regional? He's the one that saw it. I didn't see it, so uh, I think it was yesterday. Their predictions, and I was like, "Well, those are the same people who, pre- who predicted, you know, the wrong teams in the Greenville Regional and all the regionals." So um, I think it's probably best if we have it where they don't give us any respect and we go in there and take care of business. Not that it matters who they have anyway. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, we saw two years ago just how difficult of a road you can make this if um, you're looking forward a little bit. And we saw that last week. Um, I think I think this team, especially after last week and how things started in Clearwater, if that didn't snap them into the realization that they that they have to be the aggressor, that they have to show themselves as one of the best teams in the nation. Um, if they don't do that, then they will get beat by anybody. A team 20 games under 500 destroyed them in Clearwater. And a team who is one game under 500 that just won their conference will easily do that to them tomorrow if they are looking forward. Um, so it, it, you know, if guys who are, you know, not on that 2019 team, but are on this team starting to maybe waver a little bit attention wise and looking ahead to maybe a rematch with Charlotte or seeing Maryland. Uh, I think that's being reset here because we have two recent examples of the danger that can cause the damage that can cause. And the pirates got out of the regional in 19 and they made a run to the semifinals in Clearwater. But if you're going to drop the first game against a team, you should beat um, you're making life exceptionally hard on yourself to do what you want to do here, to do what you want to be and go where you want to go. Um, This team is good enough to win this regional. Um, it has to start against Norfolk State. You can't think about anybody else right now. Corey, a few minutes ago, you talked about James Deloach uh, getting the ball for Norfolk State. 7-2, 258 ERA uh, in 66 and a third. Uh, opponents are hitting uh, 217 against him. Uh, he has walked 41 and uh, also you know, hit some. So his command seems to have been kind of spotty at times, but uh, – He's really pitched well of late. I heard a number today uh, give credit to Stephen Igo of Hoist of Colors. He said that he had worked, worked excuse me, 22 consecutive uh, scoreless innings. He kind of strikes me as an effectively wild type of guy where he's walking in, you know, most of his outings this year, he's walked at least four batters a game. But you're right, he's gone 22 straight scoreless innings in games that Norfolk needed to win. And um, so I'm fascinated to see what stuff he's got. Um, over the year, lefties have given the Pirates a little bit more trouble, but entering the tournament, this team actually is hitting lefties better than righties. It's a small split but um, and a small difference, but they are hitting lefties a little bit better. Um, this team over the last few weeks has changed things around lineup-wise with a lefty on the mound against them where, you know, Whirl is switching to right-handed, which is his weaker side. Makarevich really hasn't even been in the lineup against lefties because hitting right-handed is his weaker situ- side by far. Um, and But that has left them to put more left-handers, true left-handers in, like Riley Johnson's going to be getting starts, uh, even with a lefty on the mound. So how this team has to structure their lineup is a little bit different with a lefty on the hill than a righty. That's where Norfolk's coming from here. Even though the team's hitting 306 against lefties as opposed to 300 against right-handers right now, they see what a one through nine is going to maybe look like for ECU and see a much better way through by switching a couple switch hitters to the other side here and maybe getting one of them out of the lineup as opposed to going with Danny Hosley, who is their two-way guy and has been exceptional as a righty pitcher. So they're going to go with their southpaw here, and it's going to be up to the Pirates to um, not chase because the Loach will miss. He will, he will give you free options. Um, don't go after it. That's why first three innings are so fascinating to me, not just from Carson's side of things, but about how the Pirates attack Deloach and how they are they aggressive against a guy that will put you on if you are patient with him, or do they think they have something on him? Do they think they have his fastball picked up and they go after it right away? Um, it's going to be an interesting cat and mouse game here uh, to start off this regional. No question. I would ask you, Corey, how many tickets are available right now? Uh, have you heard uh, for today? Do you know? I've heard nothing about tickets. I knew I knew single game tickets. I think went on sale yesterday. Um, uh, don't quote me on that. I know they're anticipating not having many available, if any, uh, once things get underway tomorrow. So um, I do not have a hookup either. I have been asked. 
I have no avenue to get tickets. That's how high demand they are right now. And I know people, and those people don't have avenues for me either. Do you have a ticket to get in? I have a credential. I'm going to have to okay. utilize that. <laughs> Uh, they will need to allow me to work. I will, uh, so I'll be able to attend the games and also okay, good. Um, call them in the process. That'll be kind of hard to do the game from your car, right, or the parking lot. I've done it before, not here, but I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> I've called oh, a football game from the back of a pickup truck before. I'll call this baseball game from the back of my car. I'll do it. No. Oh. Well, Bubba, we have a very excited to have a former ECU baseball player, Evan Balva. Hey, Evan, how are you, man? I'm doing good. How are you guys? Well, very excited to have you on. Excited to talk. Can you hear me? Yeah. Absolutely, man. Excited to have uh, you on about talking about ECU baseball, this particular case, the regional. Your former player has experience uh, playing in regionals, playing pirate baseball. Um, what's your mindset as a, uh, a player going into this week? How, how, how tough is it? Really hard? Is it stressful? Uh, more than normal? No, I mean, I think the the people that make it stressful are kind of the the outside voices, everybody that that really overanalyzes everything. I mean, when you when you when you think about it, it's it's still the same game of baseball that you've played all year. Um, it's a little bit more riding on the line, um, but you know that makes it fun. It makes it exciting. Uh, it's promising to know you, you you're, you're probably going to bring your best effort when it comes to that. No question. And you had a lot of experience throughout the years. Uh, what are your, you have some favorite memories, maybe uh, behind the scenes of the regionals where we're former players, or is there anything that you can share on, on a show where you won't get in trouble? I guess the uh, statute of limitations passed now. You don't have to do any running now with coach or anything, right? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good on that. I uh, luckily don't have to do any more conditioning. Um, I got, I got, at a lifetime's worth in my five years there, so I'm 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 good on that. Um, but I'd say, I mean, obviously, you know, every time we've been able to play in the postseason, it's been great memories. Um, but yeah, some of my favorite, uh, definitely down Texas Tech, uh, winning game one, um, and they come so close in game two. Uh, that that was exciting, you know, getting your feet wet. Um, but I'd have to say probably my favorite would be the in, in 19, um, after losing game one to Quinnipiac. Uh, I also gave up that home run to, to put them up. So uh, I'm sure Pirate fans were very happy with me for a little bit. But, uh, but after, go, after going down one game, um, to see what our team did over the next two, three days was just – it's unbelievable. You can't really, you can't draw it up like that. Showing up, beating state game one, uh, then Quinnipiac again, and then and then taking two from Campbell. That uh, that was definitely the best moment in the postseason. Just because you know everything, all the odds were stacked against us after losing game one, uh, and being able to persevere and and come back and and run the table from there. That was that was pretty special to be a part of. And Evan, the, the fact of the matter is we know that Coach Godwin and all the coaches and the staff and the players are not overlooking Norfolk State. There might be some pa fans in Pirate Ma Nation overlooking uh, Norfolk State, uh, but I can guarantee you, uh, I'm sure you can add to that, being a former player, you're not overlooking Norf Norfolk State. No, no. I mean, the the most important game of uh, the regional is game one. If you can, if you can win game one, it kind of sets the table up good uh, and kind of allows everything to go according to plan. But I can assure you, I've, I've been I've been in that uh, in the clubhouse and I can assure you they're not looking past Norfolk State, especially after, you know, we lost to Quinnipiac in 19. I'm sure he's he's definitely reminding the guys of that and that that anybody can beat anybody on any given day. Uh, so I would say no, no, they're definitely definitely not overlooking Norfolk State. Yeah, guys, and really, there's no need to. You can't play anybody else besides Norfolk State. I mean, literally, that's the only team you can play right now. So you might as well be focused in on that one and worry about Charlotte and Maryland later. No doubt. I mean, that's yeah. When I mean, you're looking... I mean, Norfolk State's a good team. Every 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 team in the regional is a good team. Um, I mean, if they weren't good, they would they wouldn't be in the postseason. And uh, 
the record might not show it, but I mean, they're hot right now. They just won the conference tournament. Uh, so everybody's going to be playing up a little bit. And, you know, teams are tough to beat when, they, when they're riding on a high. So, Do you guys give any validity? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really – off the top of my head, I don't know the last time Norfolk State was in a regional. Uh, Charlotte, I don't, I don't think they've been to recently. Maybe I'm wrong on that. And, uh, this Mar- is the first regional cup. Ever? This Norfolk, Norfolk yeah. State. Norfolk State. Oh, wow. Okay. And then uh, I don't, what about Maryland? What, what is their experience? In both Maryland seasons? was in in 17. That's their last. Charlotte hasn't been in since 2011. Okay, so none of these guys, with the exception of East Carolina, has any experience playing in the postseason. So uh, that's uh, that should be a huge advantage for us. You would you would think anyway, right? I mean, with the consistency we've had of playing in the postseason, um, yeah, I think we we definitely have the upper hand as far as experience goes. But but like I said, you know, anybody can be anybody any given day, especially this time of year. It's, uh, it's tough to win baseball games this, t- this time of year. I mean, teams are hot. Um, they're feeling themselves. So, you can't you can't take anybody for granted. How do you think – you know, we, we've talked at length on here about this is going to be the first game with a with a full house or the potential for a full house. And, uh, you know, how the Pirate fans are going to react to it. But, you know, Norfolk State hadn't played in front of a crowd this year. I would imagine Maryland, with the way the Big Ten schools are, I don't know if they played in front of any fans. And Charlotte's been like we have, limited capacity, with the exception of maybe down in Louisiana Tech and Southern Miss uh, in conference play. But uh, so the opponents also, this is going to be their first time this year playing in front of a crowd. Yeah, I mean, it. Uh, it's either going to work towards their favor or against their favor. I mean, sometimes you, when you when you play smaller schools like that that haven't haven't played in front of a crowd all year, um, it kind of hypes them up a little bit too. I mean, we saw that in Quinnipiac in '19. I mean, everybody was there pulling for us, but it also jacked them up to be able to play in front of a crowd and and you know have the chance to to play in front of I don't know what was it five thousand people like that. That's something that they. They've never done before, and I don't know if they'll do it again. So it uh it can play to their advantage as well. Oh. No question with the uh... Evan. Go ahead, Dave. Okay, I was just going to ask about uh, Evan as far as the you know uh, guys uh, still on this team. Um, what about last year compared to not having much of a season? There's a lot of guys like Connor Norby and Gavin Williams. I mean, their stock value has gone way up. It's great to see how I know Coach talked about you could actually work really hard individually and do very well like they have, or the team could have just taken the year off and not really done much with their craft, so to speak. Uh, But what do you think about um, having that pretty much a year off and then coming back and now doing very well? Um, I think uh, I think the year off definitely uh, definitely set a lot of people apart and it exposed some people just because I mean there was there was a full year off and it, it was kind of up to you individually whether you wanted to go in and get your work in or not. Um, but I remember I was up at next level uh, working out there and I saw Norby, Gavin, and I mean a ton of other guys, but they they were constantly in there when they couldn't work out at ECU. They were constantly in there. Uh, trying to get better and like I, said, I still know some of those guys and talk to some of those guys and and know what kind of people they are and I know they're hard working people um but I know they also care a lot about the team um so yeah get being able to see I, I mean I don't think there's anybody in the country who's uh draft stocks risen as much as Norby's has this year I mean I get I, I got the chance to watch him play in Clearwater uh last week and like seeing that in person it's uh it's something special to see um and Gavin Williams too, which I know he's a you know a top prospect coming in, but you know he's really he's really uh, taking the the bull by the horn, so to speak, and and it's shown this year. Evan, you uh you, you know you you've dealt with regionals and weather, and yeah, just other games and weather. Um, how how does it affect a baseball team uh, when games get delayed, pushed back? You, you have weather delays in the middle of the game. 
you have to wait and find out when your start time is. Do you just take it as drive, or can it get to you? How, how do you keep it from getting in your head? Uh, I mean, it's tough. I mean, it's definitely tough when, when the game gets pushed back because you, you've been waiting. You've been waiting all week to play, and then you know it finally gets here, and then you got to put everything on pause for a little bit. But uh, you definitely, you definitely, uh, the caffeine starts wearing off a little bit, um, and. and I think, at least for us, I think we kind of got as many rain delays as we had in 18 and 19. I think we kind of got tired of being, being that close to each other, uh, confined to the locker room. Um, we just want to get outside and play. Uh, we had all, all this built-up energy, and we were, we were just ready to play. So, I mean, it, it gets to you a little bit. Um, but I think a rain delay – pre-game versus it's a little better than having you know a rain delay mid-game like wilmington yeah 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 yeah, just like wilmington that's exactly what i was thinking of the the one in 18 that was like the longest Corey, how about you as a broadcaster that had to be uh really hard for you because there was what a, a handful i forgot how many hours it was in between when Agnos was pitching and he's, I mean, he was throwing out of his mind. It was like, what, five, nothing or something. And then you have uh, where, and all of a sudden it's a million hours. It just seemed like it was forever for that rain delay. One of the longest some ever. Like, some like three or four hours. Like it was a while. And, you know, I, I think initially we were looking at the radar and it's like, all right, this won't be too long here. And like maybe Agnos will be able to come back out. And then it just kept going and going. And I maybe fell asleep in my booth a little bit and just kept rolling around. I was like, all right, Agnos isn't coming back, but they're still at 5 nothing. And then the way everything just restarted there in that game was unpleasant, <laughs> to say the least. It's one of the more shocking uh, experiences of calling this team in my six years, that, that one inning there against UNCW right after the rain delay, which... I can't imagine even they, frankly, saw coming. The Seahawks even probably didn't even see that coming. Um, luckily, there haven't been many scenarios like that since or even prior to that with this program. But, uh, no, I, we are talking about this for tomorrow. If they can't start at noon, um, they're going to do everything they can to make sure they start and finish without rain. Like, they aren't going to start and then stop, knowing that rain's in the forecast throughout the day. I don't Cliff won't allow that. Key Shoe may want to allow that for Norfolk. The NCAA shouldn't allow that. Um, they're going to make sure that something like 18 won't happen again. No question. Evan, was that, uh, that, that's got to be hard. Uh, your pitcher, I mean, uh, a rain delay, how, how much does that affect you guys as far as momentum, the command? I mean, um, that's got to be tough uh, to come out and, you know, you've waited a few hours and you got to come out and pitch. No, I mean, it's definitely tough. I uh, I couldn't imagine, you know, starting the game and uh, then coming back out and pitching. Like, I just can imagine doing that. But, yeah, I mean, it's tough. You, you're you all jacked up, like I said, and then you go in, you've got three, four hours of downtime. So then you got to re, re-fire that up again. And it's, it's tough to do, especially um, in the sense of 18. Like, we had everything going for us. We were playing great. Um, and then, you know, come out of the rain delay. And it just it didn't seem like we could buy an out. Nobody. I mean, anybody we ran out there, nobody could buy an out. And it's uh, it's tough. No question about it. We're looking forward to a regional. And uh, so no midnight start. We learned that tonight uh, from Corey Glore. We I'm can... not the official NCAA guy, but they're, <laughs> they will make sure they don't start at midnight tomorrow. Like that, just I'll give you that. They'll, they'll, go, I, they'll I, start as late at nine, like that, like South Carolina at eighteen. But we ain't starting at midnight tomorrow. I'm hoping I will that not uh, be calling a game at midnight tomorrow. Let me just put that that way. Evan, are you up for I calling mean, a game? Never, tomorrow? never say never. Oh, wait a minute, what's <laughs> that, Corey? Corey, wait a minute now. If they start at nine o'clock, <laughs> you could be calling a game at midnight. Well, with the way with how long starting. we play games, we'll bleed over to midnight. But if it's starting at midnight, <laughs> uh. I, I might make a, a fan might be able to do my job for that game. All right. <laughs> hey, Bubba, Bubba, are you, are you available? <laughs> I'm not. Okay. All right. So, oh, uh, well, I guess we're going to have to do the game uh, way earlier, but, uh, and everybody can make a run to Waffle House for Corey. I think that would be great. Waffle House, oh, Denny, Dave, I, 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 I
Joe oh Joe's my God! With me this weekend, he's in. Yeah, he's not there. Rep. Yeah, he's in. He's in Austin. That's Texas right. This Sorry. Yeah. Corey's there. Are you gonna be following flying solo, or are you gonna, you gonna Malcolm gonna get in the booth with you? Malcolm's running around like a chicken with his head cut off this weekend. He's running a regional, <laughs> so I am I am on my own and, unless Evan wants to fly up and join me here. But um, I think I actually it, you nearly joined. Oh me. man, I'm I'm already here. I'm 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 in Greenville, man. Oh, you're in Greenville. Boy. Come on in. I'm back, man. So are you, you're coming to games, I'm guessing, here. Oh yeah, I'll be I'll be I'll be a fan. Okay. Be a All fan right. this weekend. I think I nearly got you on in one of the conference tournaments the year you missed due to your injury. Um, but like you just strolled into yeah, the hotel. I, I do remember that. I was like, hey, come into the booth, and you're like, Really? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Corey, Frank Durham chimes in on YouTube saying I'm your Huckleberry. <laughs> the the list starts now to uh, step in for me here if we start a game after midnight. Yeah, the- yeah. I can't believe I forgot that about Coach O. He's only done that what twenty years now. Yeah, he's been doing a lot, and I know he was telling me he was hoping he'd go to Austin. He's going to Austin, so he gets to run that regional. So, well, why is uh why is that where he wanted to go? Because he's been to a lot of the other places that were selected this year. And okay. so he's like in Austin's a little bit more favorable of a town than say Starkville. Okay. So my apologies to Starkville, but um, no, Austin's a little bit of a cool I, environment. I, I didn't know if Coach O was really big into the red dirt music scene. Uh, you never know. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. There no, we go. Sure no doubt. No doubt. Uh, we'll have. Um, with this, with the regional tickets, hopefully, if you haven't gotten any tickets, it's probably too late. But uh, maybe on the, maybe you can go outside. You see the dude with the trench coat and the fedora. Maybe you can get him to give you some tickets tomorrow. Uh, keep keep an eye open for tomorrow morning. If there are some available, they'll probably release them tomorrow morning. Um, that's usually how they've done this in years past. But again, I don't know. The demand's been pretty strong for this one. So even more so than previous years. So. Yeah, and ch- I would recommend also, guys, check um check the Charlotte and the Maryland message boards, and just ask their fans if anybody's in Greenville that didn't plan on going to Game One, the East Carolina, uh, Norfolk State game, and chances are you'll you'll probably be able to get a ticket. Uh, a lot of those fans will you know will only use the tickets to their team's games. So uh, for Game One, you may be able to score a ticket from Charlotte or Maryland fans. And, and not every. You know, they'll release tickets that aren't sucked in by the three other teams either. Like, they're, every team gets an allotment of tickets, and right. they all get the same number for the three road teams. So, any of them not eaten up by Norfolk or Charlotte or Maryland, they will become available at some point if they aren't already. So, so keep an eye open tomorrow morning because some might be dropping in through, like, the ECU ticket um, office. And before we let you guys go, uh, I know both of you being a play-by-play guy and a former pitcher of the Pirates, can you give us your favorite memories of the regionals? Whoever wants to take that first. I, I mean, I, I mean, I think I said it earlier, but uh, my fa- my favorite memory from the regional is uh, uh, 2019. Um, okay. Obviously, losing to Quinnipiac wasn't fun in the moment, but being able to come back and win four straight like we did. Um, that that was definitely the coolest moment for me as a player. Just when all the odds were stacked against us, we, we persevered and, and and came back and, and and ran the table. So I mean, that was the most fun environment to be a part of, hands down. The the 2019 run was as insane of a run I've been a part of because it was just so much in such a small amount of time, and all the games were long. And it was just, it, I was so punk drunk by the end of it. But the the way that regional ended, and because he's sitting here on the show right now, when Evan comes out for the final two outs of that regional, gets the strikeout and the fly out to end it. And I, I, after I wrapped up my broadcast, I went down to the field and I saw Evan. And I said, it had to be you to finish this one. It had to be you. And he said, absolutely. Like that. that's, that's those little moments like off air that I remember being down the field and celebrating with the team after that regional and, and talking to Evan was a huge part of that. Like that, that will always stick with me. What about your call in 16 of uh, the, uh, the, the, the UVA game court? I mean, that that's going to be an all timer. My voice popped. I still haven't gotten it back. 
um that was such a i was like a five run ninth inning like oh. it, and that game was so frustrating like they had so many chances to actually not lose that game and it looked like they were going to and then um travis just he got a hold of one to say the least and, and won that game that that's a that that was something special um and that it, it but it got him to the championship game that wasn't even a championship game yet. yep um uh the way 19 ended was um just the build up to that whole thing those 48 hours were just insane just absolutely insane yeah and, and dave you didn't ask me but i'm gonna give my favorite real fast uh oh nine uh, against south carolina you had to beat them twice game two the grand slam and then uh and, and then beating them in the bottom of the ninth with the roller scorer from uh from third base uh that was uh unbelievable and evan very quickly before we let you go um you know, you were one of a few pirate pitchers over the last several years on guys like Davis Kirkpatrick also, you know, coming off an injury and then you had uh, such an excellent senior season in 2019, a team high 32 appearances. Just talk about that. I mean, it was, uh, I was, I was definitely blessed to be able to, to, you know, undergo Tommy John surgery. Um, you know, I had, I had the best athletic trainer in the country and Zach Womack to, to help be with me by my, by my side throughout that whole process. And, you know, we worked hard that whole year, that whole year I had off to, uh, there's just so many small things like that, that, uh, that built, built up to the, to the following season where I was able to come out and, you know, have a successful year. Um, but it was, you know, to be able to, I had so many ups and downs throughout my entire career and to kind of be able to hang my hat up, um, as an ECU pirate, on that note, was uh, it was so special to me, and I'm I'm forever in Pirate Nation's debt. I'm forever in the coaches' debt, the staff, everybody that kind of helped me out along the way. There's just been so many, too many people to name, um, but it was just a lot that you know I'd gone through in five years to be able to 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 have that be the way that that things ended for me. It was it was it was awesome. What are you doing in Greenville now? Evan, you said you're back uh, in Greenville. Yeah, so I uh, kind of caught the injury bug this year in spring training. I had I was battling a hamstring injury, um, got that fixed, and then uh, finally got back on the mound. I had an arm injury, luckily, you know, no surgery. So I'm I'm back here rehabbing, uh, trying to get that right. So with COVID protocols and everything, we're not allowed to to stay at the team complex down in Tampa. So uh, they got me over at Young's rehabbing now. So trying to get that right, you know, six to eight more weeks, and then hopefully be starting to head back down there. Right. Evan, I'm sure Larry's taking care of you over at Young's, correct? Oh yeah, man. I see. I see Larry all the time. He's uh, he's one of the best. He's he's kind of he's uh kind of running the show over there. <laughs> Well, Evan, thank you so much for all you did for Pirate Nation. Joy to have you on tonight. Appreciate you very much. Corey, man, as always, we're looking forward to the broadcast. And it'll be 15 minutes before first pitch, right? So it, will, it won't be 11.45 tomorrow night. It'll be hopefully tomorrow night, but not that late. Right now, it's 11.45 a.m. for a 12.06 <laughs> first pitch. I am ranking on that. I will go to the park at 10, and we'll see what happens from that point forward. Uh, but uh, you you will obviously know when things are going to be happening this weekend. But I certainly hope if you're not there, you can join me for the ride because I think it'll be a pretty fun one this weekend. It's going to be great. Guys, thank you so much and look forward to seeing you this weekend at the ballpark. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. So I appreciate you being much. All right. Bye-bye. Very nice of Corey Glore and a former pitcher of the Pirates, Evan Bolivar. To join us and right now hey we've got uh, two guys we've got guys from the nine report appreciate you guys uh, we have nick and obviously uh, kevin on guys appreciate you coming on uh, it's going to be a lot of fun uh, this weekend are you guys coming down to the regional in greenville leaving in the morning Where are you we burned? Your... yeah we're, we're heading out first thing in the morning yeah bring your butt it's, it's, it's wet it's, it's, it's wet i don't, I don't know <laughs> A lot of ideas out y'all's way, but down east, uh, a lot of rain. 
Yeah, Kyle, I think uh, down east it's been a lot worse than out here. Obviously, these guys are in my neck of the woods here um, with me being in China Grove. And uh, I like that uh, Cannonballer shirt, Nick. Yeah, yeah, I got to represent K-Town. We're right down the road. Uh, you got a tremendous – I was hanging out with Bubba last year. You guys have a tremendous ballpark. That is, um, You know, I was a huge Dale Earnhardt fan, and I love the Intimidators, but I have to say the ballpark looks fantastic. Yeah, it's it's a it's a one thousand percent upgrade. Um, I mean, we went out to Intimidators games mainly when guys of ours, you know, would pass through, you know, playing in the minors. But that that stadium, the the old Intimidator Stadium, um, just made it difficult to go to games. To be honest with you, and and now that the Atrium Health Ballpark in downtown Annapolis, how could you not want to go to it? Yeah, I think Kyle would like the uh, the bar out in center field. What do you think, Bubba? I'm sure he is a lot of folks would. Um, it's definitely, definitely a nice setup and um, love what the city of Kannapolis has done with it. You know, well, uh, we could talk about the, the Cannonballers a, a lot the, tonight, but we want to talk about the regional. We want to get your perspective uh, from, from the Diamond uh, for the 49ers. Uh, what do you think uh, coming into this weekend and Greenville? Whoever wants to take it. Go go ahead, Kevin. Tell break it to him. Break it to All him right. gently, Kevin. All right, I'll go. I'll go ahead and talk to him. Um, we're excited. It's been like I said, it's been ten years since we've been in a regional. Um, we've been close a few times, going on the bubble, but um, we were definitely we were definitely in this year. Um, we were listed as one of the twenty potential host sites, so that was exciting. First time in in, in school history, we've been uh, on the verge of hosting, so that's, that's exciting. First time in the two seed, so. Um, a lot, a lot of positive momentum going with the program, especially with second-year coach Robert Woodard um, and his staff. Uh, they've kind of exceeded expectations uh, up to this point. Um, but as far as going to Greenville, we're, we're excited to get, hit the road in the morning. Uh, we know there's going to be a, a lot of fans out there, especially ECU. I'm not sure the Maryland crowd is going to be, but um, uh, sounds like we filled out our allotment and uh, bringing a lot of our fans with us. That was one of my questions I had for you guys. Do you know how many uh, tickets uh, you guys have sold? I mean, it sounds like, I mean, I didn't realize it had been a decade since you guys had been in a regional, but uh, certainly I know the 49er fans have to be excited and it's not too, it's a quick drive compared to where you could have been. Yeah, the um, I, I don't know about the numbers on the tickets, but I know that uh, Kevin and I were definitely scrambling uh, behind the scenes trying to trying to get things taken care of uh, to get down there. So you know, um, I, I'm sure we'll have we'll have a good contingent. Uh, certainly, there will obviously be more purple, and we get that, and that's cool. I was, you know, we had a great time in Greenville earlier in the year. Uh, got a chance to come down to that Saturday game. Uh, of our series in Greenville there. And it's a good environment. Um, at, you know, the capacities were still low back then, but uh, great crowd in Greenville. And, you know, it's, it's a good, um, it's a good baseball environment. Um, it's, uh, they're, they're, they're baseball savvy, you know, so it's, it's fun to, fun to get down there and watch a game. Um, it, it's, it's going to be a long weekend. Uh, I think it sounds like, and I, I was already listening to you guys talk about uh, the, the forecast and midnight starts. Um, Go ahead, the, the Charlotte folks. Go ahead, mark us down as anti midnight start, uh, especially if y'all are playing first <laughs> and you're starting at midnight. Um, so you know it, it's just one of those deals. But yeah, it, it has been a decade. Like Kevin said, we've been close a couple of times, but yeah, it's uh, 2011 was our last trip to the tournament, and they sent us uh, they sent us to Arizona State. So uh, the drive to Greenville tomorrow will be much, much easier to make. Yeah, Charlotte Char Char playing in Conference USA these days. Um, uh, Pirates, former home. We know about CUSA baseball. Of course, it used to be dominated by Rice. Uh, Rice ain't what they used to be, but the league was really strong this year uh, with Southern Miss and Louisiana Tech. Uh, then you had, uh, you had Old Dominion kind of come out of nowhere. Uh, and had had a, had a great year. Uh, talk about the strength of the league. That's something that um, I think you know maybe actually plays in your guys' favor a little bit. I think overall, conference USA was a stronger league this year than the American uh, and the Big Ten. Um, so uh, talk about uh, y'all's impressions of conference USA this year and uh, how uh, how playing in that league may uh, may help you guys in the regional. 
Well, I'll say this about Conference USA, and Kevin can can tack on to that. But, you know, when we made our last trip in 2011, we were in the Atlantic 10. And that that's where we stopped after conference, the, the, the previous version of Conference USA. Um, when, when that league kind of when everybody kind of went their own ways, we ended up in the Atlantic 10. And that is uh, it's a quality basketball league. Uh, but as it, it's a, it is a baseball um well, it's just not that great for baseball. So we were very successful in it, but it was a one bid league to your point. Um, so when, when we were able to move back to conference USA, uh, that was the first thing on our minds was, Oh my gosh, we're going back to a baseball league. Um, Cause it just matters so much being here in the, in the South and the recruiting uh, the scheduling. And, and like you said, just the ability to play, uh, not only a non-conference schedule, but a, a conference schedule that can put you in position to have an RPI in the 20s uh, or better and and to be in position to get an at bid an, an at large bid. I mean that's this was our second at large bid in, um, in in program history and largely because for a long time we've been you know we've been in a one bid league and and that's just tough, tough going. Um, as far as this year goes, not only the strength, as you mentioned, but I, I think and this is something that's kind of flown under the radar a little bit, maybe. But the, the conferences that played the four game weekends, uh, which which Conference USA did, and they, I believe you guys did, too. Am I, am I right about that? Yeah, we did. That's great. Yeah, I think that's a huge advantage for all of us that did that, um, because when you're coming into a, a, a regional situation where if you're used to playing the, the standard three game weekend, um, you know, we have had to develop uh, deeper pitching uh, just just by necessity. Um, and, and where if you're playing that three game that three game set, the traditional three game weekend, maybe you don't have to focus on it as much. Not that you don't want to, but I think it's a huge advantage for all of us that did that because it was a war. I mean, nobody wants to do it again, including us. I don't ever want to see four game weekends again. <laughs> but um, I think for right now, it's it's been great preparation. Um, Kevin, I'll let you I'll let you correct my misstatements now. <laughs> well, uh, like I said, the league was definitely strong this year. I think OU was kind of up there, but not as high as uh, Southern Miss and La Tech. They've been at the top of the league the past few years, uh, traditional powers in our conference. Um, and ODU just had a great year. Uh, they, they had a good start last year before COVID hit, and um, they kind of picked up where they left off. Uh, had a great offense, and um, we saw a lot of on two weekends in a row for four games each weekend, and that was uh, that was a, a fun two weeks. Uh, just like a World Series with eight games between the two. Uh, but we ended up splitting four, four, three, our, we went with three and one in our place and, and, three, and one and three at, at theirs. Um, but uh, their offense is very explosive. Um, put up a lot of runs. We our, our offense put up a lot of runs in our in our stadium. Um, but uh, yeah, the strength of the league is um, it was good to see this year. Uh, top five in um, conference RPI for a good part of the season. So um, hopefully, they get there, hopefully, Rice will get their uh, their uh, stuff together, and, and and it will be a solid league for for years in the future. Are you guys surprised, and then we'll get back on our regional, just one more note on Conference USA. Uh, are you guys surprised that Old Dominion didn't work something out with the Norfolk Tide or with another ballpark in that area to try to host? I mean, I, I know their their stadium really isn't capable of hosting, but plenty of, plenty of quality uh, ballparks in that Norfolk, Virginia Beach area. Uh, surprises me they didn't work anything out and put in a bid. I don't know. I've heard I've heard that they were they were working on something, but uh, kind of didn't get this didn't, didn't get it worked out in time to, to host. Uh, no, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but uh, it's unfortunate because they're definitely uh, they were the hottest team in the league uh, down the stretch for sure, going into the tournament, and then they followed through in the tournament and ended up winning it um, on La Tech's uh, field. So uh, I think they were trying to work it out, but I don't think they can work out the final details and get it get a bid in in time. I think those bids came in in early April. They had to put them in early April. So yeah, that's correct. In time. Yeah, I, I don't know what happened, but I, I guarantee you, I wish they had now. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I I mean, think about it. What if 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 we were, you know, 
you know, I, I mean, that's got to be, gosh, it's it's five and a half hours to to Norfolk from here and then another hour and a half to Columbia. I mean, that's, you know, I don't know, maybe a little closer you go straight down 95. Anyway, if, if I was in that position, if I was, you know, if, if we were uh, Diamond Monarch report, I'd be pretty ticked about it. Um, if, if we were finally getting to a one seat and we had to do it, you know, two states away. Yeah, back well, in hey, 1999 and uh, yeah. 2000, we, we had enough of that life. Uh, 99, and we went to LSU and nearly won the thing, we beat LSU and then had them on the ropes eight to one. And, uh, and, and when they LSU came, came back won and won, and then they won the second game. Um, and then in 2000, we had to host down at – or be the number one seed uh, down at Louisiana. And then 2001, we finally, uh, you know, got a bid in and hosted in Wilson. Yeah, that and you know, I mean, on the at the same front, I mean, you guys are, are familiar with with our situation. We we were one of the, the finalists, and we had to submit Gastonia. Um, the Knights were playing home games. Uh, the, the Cannonballers were interested, but they were hosting some graduations, um, and and, oh, and that was, so they were off the table. So we ended up submitting Gastonia, uh, which is a great park, but. Um, you know, if, if, if it had gone that way, I don't know how much of a home home field advantage we would have been able to produce in Gastonia um, as, as opposed to being. I mean, you want to be on campus, right? I mean, even when you guys were in Wilson, I mean, I'm sure you were happy to do it, but you, you certainly were had to be thinking about, gosh, we should be doing this on campus. Oh, there's no yeah, question. No, 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 also no. The, and Bubba, I remember the 2001, the Super Regional we played against Tennessee. We played that in Kinston. Uh, Wilson and Kinston have great ballparks, but uh, nothing like Clark LeClaire. No offense to them because we love both of them, but uh, certainly uh, we won there, so we love it. But still, uh, the fact that we can host our own regional and hopefully one day uh, super regional for sure. Guys, I want to talk about your coach. You've got a great coach in Robert Woodard. Thank a lot of him. He's been great to our show coming on. Lots of access. Uh, great pitcher. Great coaching tree with Coach Mike Fox uh, with a tremendous program at North Carolina. He comes to Charlotte, a great uh, recruiting ground, and the guy knows the state very well. Uh, talk about the uh, fan base. How are you guys? You guys have got to be very excited to have him and what he's doing for your program. Yeah, how, how could you not be? You know, um, the the he he came in and replaced um you know lauren hibbs was able to go back to his alma mater uh, and help eric wedge uh kind of uh, work on the the wichita state program so it was a, a dream opportunity for him we're going to have you know we had we were going to have a new coach for the first time in 25 years I mean, that's what it amounted to uh with with replacing lauren and um you know robert came in woody woody came in and um i mean just from the from the very start was was very transparent He's very transparent with us, with the fan base. I mean, heck, like you said, he comes on your show. Um, he'll talk to anybody. And and that guy, that guy loves baseball. All he wants to talk about is baseball. And, and if somebody is somewhere wanting to talk baseball, he's there. Um, I, I got to tell you, and just from my standpoint, let Kevin, Kevin um, uh, weigh in on this, but – He's so analytical and he looks at baseball such a different way. Um, for me, it's almost been, I mean, I've, I've been um, watching baseball since I was a little kid, but in the last couple of years he's been here, it's almost been like relearning the game. Um, he just approaches things with, with a very cutting edge uh, viewpoint. And uh, I mean, it's, it's been a, it's been tremendous just to not only the excitement that, you know, the winning creates, but, just really learning a new perspective has been a lot of fun. So it's, it's been great. Talk about the season too, as well uh, for Pirate fans and fans that are watching now. Uh, we obviously East Carolina saw you earlier in the year, but there's a lot of difference, uh, big difference between close up March and now it's June. Right, You'll feel uh, that. Okay. Start. Yeah. I'll, I'll start on that. Um, it started off pretty hot this year, um, and then we had a uh, we had a, a tough schedule stretch. We had ECU um, and Tennessee and Wake Forest kind of all in uh, within like ten days. Uh, we ended up beating Tennessee at home nine nine zero, and then and then went to play ECU that weekend. Um, it was a pretty close series, uh, but um, uh, obviously you guys got three games from us. Um, after that, we 
came back home and uh, we lost two or three to Western Carolina. Uh, and after that, it kind of clicked. Uh, went on a big run in conference. Um, I think we had like four sweep, uh, two straight sweeps in a row. And then um, leading up to the ODU series, the, the, the huge eight game series, that was a, a big uh, in our season where we were kind of, we had elevated up to 15th in the country. And I think our RPI was up at 9-10. Um, and then uh, continue that through the rest of the year. But uh, we had a few injuries. We, we lost uh, our, our first base with Dave McKay for a good portion of the season. Um, he's finally getting back now. Uh, he's, funny enough, he, he missed a, a good chunk of the season, but he's still uh, leading our team in homers uh, with 12. Uh, but um, uh, – other than that, yeah, we, we've uh, battled through and um, uh, finished kind of strong with our, our, our regular season and ended up uh, winning the championship, uh, conference, regular season championship. I'll, I'll say this about, about this weekend and, and what we're doing. Uh, I, I, I'm just personally, our offense, we can, we can get the job done, uh, whether it's uh, Maryland, uh, Maryland tomorrow, for you guys Saturday, whatever happens. Uh, the offense can get the job done. I think we've we've shown that. Um, what it boils down to is on the on the pitching side, if uh, if we get that buttoned up, um, throw enough strikes, play in the clean defense. I mean, we got a shot. I like it. Um, and and I'm not just I'm not just. I mean, I do have green tinted glasses, but you know, there have definitely been times in the past where even uh, even coming up against uh, a program like you guys where I would have looked at it and just if I was being honest said eh, we're gonna you know we're gonna need some help you know if we're gonna if we're gonna come out on this thing but this weekend it's possible we can do it if um, if the guys if the guys play to the level that we have seen them play uh, at times this season we can be we can be uh, we can be very competitive now I'm stopping just short of making a prediction here but uh, we we've we've got the talent, and that's that's probably what's different uh, going forward. Is is uh, just I mean, our our talent level is is definitely at a certain level as comparison to you know certainly our A ten days. Yeah. Hey, well, you know, the, uh, Nick and Kevin. Uh, one of the one of the things about this roster, and I talked with Coach Woodard about this preseason, just a major roster overhaul. Um, you know, bringing in what like twenty new players. Yeah, more. Well, you had, okay. uh, yeah, you had we had the, the you had the two recruiting classes uh, back to back, pretty much with uh, COVID and all that. So uh, had a lot of players. We had, had uh, our conference player of the year, Austin Knight. We got him last year about this time uh, from transfer from Tennessee. Uh, ended up being player of the conference player of the year in our league. So that's definitely um, one of the high points of the uh, of the recruiting, but. Um, there was a lot of roster changeover. Uh, a lot of the returning guys uh, are still are key contributors, though. Uh, and but it goes the new guys and the and the older guys have kind of meshed. It took a while because since COVID and everything uh, with limitations, but they they've meshed well. And uh, the, the returning guys with the, with the, the incoming guys have, have been uh, uh, been a force down the stretch here. That's the world we live in now, though, right? Especially with the with the transfer portal and and the ability for players to to change schools, um, you've just got to be active in that. And uh, you know, in all sports, you know, you listen to fans talk about that the the, the P five uh, is is going to you know going to poach all our rosters and you know whether it's football or basketball or whatever, going to take you know take whatever they want. Maybe there there will be some instances of that, but I tell you, I mean, so far the transfer portal is working working in our direction. Um, I mean, Austin Knight's backup third baseman at Tennessee, and now he's a first team All American. Um, you know, Will Butcher um, started at NC State; was a huge, huge piece for us. I mean, we, we've got we just got multiple guys on this team this year that have have come in. Um, so it, it, it's a it's sort of a different world we all live in now. But roster turnover might not necessarily be a bad thing always. I, I kind of use this analogy for football. Uh, I, you know, I don't know how to play out for baseball, but uh, for football, uh, I think what you're going to see is I do think you'll see pole to poaching. Uh, I use the example of we got a great running back here, and I'm not saying this is going to happen, but we got a great running back here named Roger Harris. And uh, let's say he goes and puts up uh, 
you know, uh, 150 rushing yards on South Carolina. He's from South Carolina. What's what's going to keep the Gamecocks going? Hey, son, uh, you, you, we need a running back next year. So I do think you're going to see group of five schools lose star players. But what I think you're going to see more of is kids that go, and again, I'm talking football, kids that go to Alabama, Clemson, et cetera, realize they're not going to play after one year and then transfer back to group of five schools. So I think in numbers, you're going to see more kids leave power five to come to group of five. I just think we're going to lose star players to group of five, to uh, power five schools. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, I think, and that that's a definite attitude with, with this staff is that, that, you know, no one, no one is irreplaceable and, and we're going to, we're just going to keep recruiting. And, and that, that's, that's high school, that's JUCO, that's transfer. And that's just, you know, uh, you, you're just going to have to be aggressive. No doubt about it. And we have an important que question for you guys. Do you guys like barbecue? Because we have plenty of it in Greenville, if you did not know that. Go, go ahead and tell them, Kevin. Go ahead and tell them. <laughs> you guys are all guy. Nick is a barbecue connoisseur, man. He's uh... – he takes a trip down east every every uh, every fall, right? A fishing trip, and uh, they uh, they enjoy it big time. Yeah, we, we've been uh, we've been east quite a few times. Obviously, we went, we went during basketball season. Uh, oh, I always got to stop some barbecue. Uh, in fact, we're staying we're actually staying in Kinston um, uh, this weekend. Uh, we're gonna stop by pick up some barbecue on the way in. And the, okay. the, don't 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 go to Kings. Don't go to Kings for God in heaven's sake. All right, here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're gonna do, Kyle. Um, first of all, Kevin's from Durham himself, and I'm a I'm a yeah. Charlotte boy, but but my my mama's side of the family is from Sampson County, so that's wow. that's where I, Sampson's County. Sampson County is where I learned to eat barbecue. Okay, so that's 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 kind of my deal. Um, I want you. I want you guys to tell us where we need to go and don't say, don't say bees because we got to drive tomorrow and there's no way bees will have barbecue by the time we get there. So take bees off the table. Where, where do we need to go? Skylight. Barbecue. Nation. Barbecue. Skylight. Barbecue. Nation. Skylight. Yeah, Nation. That, well, I mean, that's, they're supposed to be the, that's supposed to be the granddaddy, right? Yep. Yeah. I'm a big fan and I even like Parker's barbecue. I think there's uh uh, I like them a lot. They're great for the community. Uh, safe bet there. I know that um, Sam Jones Barbecue people. Uh, he's actually related to the folks from from Aiden at Skylight. Started his it's own a, thing. Yeah. Pete Jones was his dad. The guy that started Skylight. Yeah. yeah, he's got a bigger restaurant in, in, in Winterville called Sam Jones Barbecue. They have a bigger menu. Skylight is just going to be your whole hog barbecue, coleslaw, potato salad. Uh, Sam Jones is his expanded menu. Uh, you got smoked chicken along with the Eastern North Carolina barbecue, smoked turkey, uh, does does uh, a sweet potato cornbread. So uh, that's an option, too. Um, definitely a good option. Um, so Sam Jones. And like Dave mentioned, there's Parker's. Uh, Parker's is okay. If they want to sponsor, I'll say they're great. Um, I have not <laughs> tried I, I have not tried Moore's. Uh, I hear good things Moore's about good. Moore's. Um, I get a little nervous whenever you get into a chain, and they've got four locations now. Yeah, um, they um, the guy supposedly the guy um, Kyle, the guy used to work for the owner of Moore's used to work for. Do you guys uh, are you guys familiar with Smithfield's Chicken and Barbecue? Of course, they, he. Yeah, I thought so. So um, he supposedly really worked for them. Right? So it kind of has the Moore's kind of has the Smithfield's Chicken and Barbecue kind of feel to it. It's uh, it's a good barbecue, but. Um, it's more, it tastes like that. So if you know Smithville's chicken and barbecue, you know, Moore's. Okay. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to derail us any more than I already have here, but I, I do want to, I do want to follow up question here for Kyle. Now I know what you're going to say about Kings because I'd probably say some of the same things, mm -hmm. but cause I think they've gone all electric. Yep. I, I think they have. Yeah. Nailed it. Now, and I get that. I'm on board with that. But how do I replace? How do I replace the pig and a pup though? Because <laughs> the cornbread. <laughs> now the pig and a pup. The pig and a pup is good. The the the, yeah. the the barbecue sandwich made out of a hush puppy is is a winner. Um, Put that I like in the brunch. I, I, dude, I, I would tell you for for it, if you want to go to Kings, go to Kings. You know, if, if you enjoy it, go, go enjoy it. But. Uh, I, <sighs> If I Skylight go to Kings, I go to Kings, I'm going in the side entrance 
and I'm getting a pig and a pup to go. That's what I got. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, if you're going to do that, you do that and enjoy it. Otherwise, you know, I said skylight, but I would probably go. Sam Jones will be easy for you to access if you're coming from Kinston. It's going to be right on 11. It's going to be uh, on the wonderful side of Greenville. Just turn on Fire Tower Road and be on your right. Um, and so Sam Jones may be a good choice if you, but maybe after a ball game, uh, if you want to try something different, you want to sit down. They got a nicer atmosphere than Kings. Uh, definitely get the uh, the the sweet potato cornbread muffins if if you go there. Um, and uh, I would. Uh, but if you enjoy Kings, man, go, go get your pick in a pub. I just, you know, I live in Lagrange, which is right outside of Kinston. I, oh, yeah. I'm not impressed with Kings, never have been. Um, again, if they want to promote through this podcast, I will also change my mind and say they're great. But, you ever read at Ken's Grill in Lagrange? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, Ken's Grill. Uh, their barbecue's got a good flavor. Too much skin in it for me. I don't like a lot of skin and stuff in my barbecue. Uh, I like it clean, like Bees does it. Um, but I. Uh, uh, it, it is it is good. They only do barbecue on the weekends, um, so you can't get it during the week. But you'll be here on a weekend, so uh, yeah, it's, it's it's definitely worth checking out. I've never actually we- met Ken's, but what, but we met Ken. Um, he and his buddies brought uh, his center console over to Cape Lookout uh, some years back, and and they they walked off and left it. They they beached it to go fish on the ocean side, and they came back, and the tide had gone out, and we helped them get their boat back in the water. <laughs> Not, not nice, very, very nice guy. Uh, he, uh, uh, I've had a chance to meet him. My wife uh, knows his, his wife really well, and uh, good people. And uh, yeah, ch- check them out. Check, check if you got time over the weekend. Uh, Ken's barbecue or Ken's grill is their barbecue is definitely worth checking out. Like I said, you're you are going to find a lot of skin in the in the chopped pork. So yeah, I hope you don't mind that. Some people love that. It can be good. I, it can be. I mean, I. it, it kind of depends. It depends on how, how it's done. Hey, Bubba, Kevin, I think that we actually have a new uh, – I think we have we have a new podcast, a spinoff called The Barbecue Objective, and we have two hosts. We'll have both you guys we'll, on. We'll do it. We'll do it. Look, I tell you what, we're, 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 we're friendly. We're very friendly right now. It might, things might get a little tense this weekend, depending on how it goes. But, but after that, we can be friends again and, and talk barbecue. There you go. No doubt about yeah. it. In fact, uh, EC Pirate Nation there, he said, come see me. He's going to be cooking um, a whole pig, I think, isn't he, in the, in the jungle. I know Josh Thomas is there, there too. They, those guys in the jungle, men and women in the jungle, are just outstanding. I don't know if you'll find them outstanding, but uh, we really love them. And Pirate Nation is uh, Yeah, go find Josh Thomas and the guys in the jungle. Tell, yeah. tell them the Fourth Objective sent you. And they'll probably hook you up with the best barbecue you're going to have because they're going to – they're, they're going to cook a hog there and uh, do a little pig picking on site. So, uh, yeah, we talked to those guys on Twitter. That's, 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 that's the real deal. That's, that's hardcore right there. Cooking a whole pig over the, over the left field wall. That's pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah. We thank a lot of those folks. Well, guys, uh, before we let you go, how can uh, folks find your work? We appreciate you coming on tonight. We had a lot of fun and uh, definitely it's going to be fun this weekend in Greenville at the regional. And if you search, uh, if you search for Diamond Niner Report on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, uh, we're there. You can find us. Um, we we we're mainly a Twitter platform, um, although we we do put face put stuff on Facebook. And my more more recently, my fifteen year old daughter is teaching us how to use Instagram. So we're we're trying to learn that. Awesome right. guys, we appreciate you very much, and we'll see how things turn out and. Hopefully you'll come back on um, after the regional. It'll be great sometime soon. Yeah, man. We appreciate you guys. Uh, g- good luck this weekend, but not too much. <laughs> Let me right, guys. Have a great one. Same here. Good luck. I hope they finish no. second. <laughs> Close to first, but not first, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> that was a lot of fun tonight with the regional uh, preview, special, if you will. And we got to talk some barbecue and baseball. And let's just hope they're not uh, two in barbecue, right? Well, I mean, if they are, they are. As long as we're not. <laughs> no, I'm talking about us. Oh, yeah, no. So we not. better not be two in barbecue. Exactly. Oh, man, you talk about an empty regional, though. There will be nobody there. Good Lord, that'd be terrible. No, no I'm, I'm not wishing that, and I don't want that for the Pirates uh, for sure. So predictions, uh, do we win the regional? Who wants to go first? Bubba, Kyle, do we win it? I, I think uh, I think if anybody on this show doesn't take us and win the regional, 
then uh, you're going to have a pissed off Cliff Godwin if he hears about it. Uh, yeah, I think we win it. Um, I I, uh, I hope we, we run through it like a hot knife through butter and go 3-0 and and out of here. Uh, but I, I'll say it before and I'll say it again. Uh, we've won a couple of these things out of the loser's bracket. So if yeah. we lose a ball game, keep your head up, Pirate Nation, because uh, we've done it before. We can do it again. You, you, you can definitely win these out of the loser's bracket, particularly if you're the host team. Uh, but it sure would be nice to go 3-0. Yes, well, let's hope we can do that. And Wisenhunt is going to be pitching. Uh, he'll get the ball first. We don't know if it's going to be at noon tomorrow or whenever it'll be. We'll have up. If it, there's a schedule change, then we'll let you know, guys, uh, for that. And ladies, uh, the Empire Nation, appreciate you listening and watching. And uh, certainly you can listen to our great uh, friend, Corey Glory. He'll have the call 15 minutes before the first pitch and uh, on the Learfield IMG Network. And, of course, we'll have uh, all the – we'll figure out when uh, extra innings will be. Um, brought to you by Next Level Training Center in Greenville. want to thank our good friend uh, Trent Britt. And, obviously, uh, we also have the PGX Pitcher of the Week. And we'll have the pitcher, PGX Player of the Week as well. And we'll let you know when extra innings is going to be with the crazy schedule. We have no idea when the last game will be. And hopefully we can talk about that. Uh, for sure, as Bubba has on the screen, if you're listening, uh, don't forget to order your ECU season tickets. You can call 1-800-DIAL-ECU. You can go online, ecupirates.com. Get your season tickets today. We're going to have a lot of fun. All right, Bubba. Uh, sorry, Kyle, do you have anything before we go? No, uh, just uh, good luck to the Pirates. Hopefully the weather doesn't play too much into uh, what goes on tomorrow and the rest of this weekend. And the Pirates can uh, win this thing. All right, our friend Frank Durham says Pirates go 3-0 and this weekend and take care of business. Thank you, Frank, for that. We're running out of time. Went a little long, but appreciate the guys from the, the Diamond Niner report. That was a 49ers report. That was fantastic. Appreciate them very, very much, and uh, look forward to the regional. All right, uh, for Bubba Rosenbaum, we appreciate him very much for producing and being on tonight. Thank you, Kyle from LaGrange. Thank you, Corey Glore, Evan Volvo, and the guys, again, from the Diamond Niner report. And we'll see you next time right here on the Sports Objective. Good night, everybody. Go Pirates. Yo, what's going on, y'all? This is Udon Cheek, assistant track and field coach at East Carolina University. You are plugged into the Sports Objective podcast. If you are a fan, you are plugged into the right place. And if you're really a fan, you will share that link. My heart is purple and gold. I'm a pirate down to my soul. And I don't back down, not at all. Find out when the cannons explode. Boom!